welcome to Living Magically. I'm your host, Michelle, and this is my dear friend, Hallie. And it wouldn't be my interview series of Living Magically. Hallie wasn't the very first person I interviewed. So please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your what you what you do, and then I'll tell them about how I love you so much. No, oh, thank you so much. Well, first of all, congratulations. It's a big deal to you know get your word out into the world, get your messages out into the world, and so congratulations, Michelle, on taking a step forward in your in your own uh, journey. I think that's that's really remarkable and amazing. Um, and I can't wait to hear all the things you have to share in the coming months and years because what you have to share is so beautiful in the world. And because I feel like you're, you know, you're very much one of those people that I know is like in this world, and not of it. So I really love that. Um, I'm Hallie Evelyn. I am a transformational wealth coach uh, for women. Uh, and um, what I do mostly is wake people up. And then once those people are awake, uh, my job is to help accelerate their growth quickly as possible. And I facilitate that through a bunch of different reasons. Um, I'm the author of five books. I lead spiritual tours all over the world to sacred sites. And um, mostly I do this through my coaching. And um, we can talk more about the details of that because there's been some really oh, big, deep shifts lately about what the work is supposed to be and how that comes from. Well, just to tell the world how she affected me a little bit is the very first time I thought about going to Egypt and everybody kind of knows that I'm a little bit passionate about it. Um, this was the person that helped walk me over the line, literally in um, a ritual, uh, an energetic ritual and turned into my first true coaching. Like I had done theta healing and I've, but but to actually hire a transformational coach. This was my first coach in that world uh, that wasn't just a group program or a mm -hmm. class. And for the for the year that we did that, and then for her goddess um, goddess program that she did after that, I made these massive transformational leaps. And so she does that by by educating and also through energy work which is something we're both passionate about ritual energy work but more importantly she lives her her talk she walks her walk and i've been to her home and and into her seminars and, and her live events also into her life and she's really her and her partner are really actually living a very magical life Hmm. saying that yeah I feel like um there's a lot of coaches out there that are you know there because they got certified and they think this is important or that is important and um and they you know they're trying to show that message and I really respect and appreciate that I came through this very organically and of course um but I came through this very organically where I was like you know spirit really called me to this work um at you know, I, I spent most of my adult life as an atheist. And then, um, like, well, now I say most of my adult life. And now I'm old, so um, I, it's maybe half of my adult life. Um, but I was, I was introduced to the idea of atheism by my parents as I was growing up. That was how they raised me. And then I think I was in my mid-30s, and I, I did this. Um, I did my very first Egypt. And in one breath... You know, spirit, what I say, hit me upside the head um, and told me uh, that I have a soul and that I would never die. And um, I knew that that had such profound implications for me because um, it healed in that moment panic attacks that I had been experiencing for almost my whole life. My father, when I was 10, I, I went to him. I was literally my 10th birthday. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to get old. Well, that means I could die wait a minute what happens after that and i go to my dad and i'm like daddy daddy what happens when you die and he goes I don't want to lie to you the way that everyone lied to me when i was a child you go into the ground and the worms eat you know. and i was like i mean even at 10 years old i was like what? so 
so panic attacks ensued, and um, I had those until um, this, this day. Um, that day in Egypt when um, I got the high sign that I had a soul and I would never die, the panic attacks went away and never came back. Um, so, yeah. So, and, and then after that, it was in Egypt, like my fourth or fifth time. And, you know, I'm like running, you know, I've been running a software company when that happened. And I was running a um, real estate practice. And then I was running these tours and, and then all of a sudden we did this thing where it was a, like a, there was a ceremony of some kind up on the deck of the ship. And I was supposed to step across a line, right? Michelle, does this sound familiar? I was supposed to just step across a line and I was supposed to say the thing that was coming next. And what came out of my body is accept my, I accept my calling as a healer. And I was like, that, that and which talking about because I was like so sure like that's not my path and I also burst into tears at the time and I was like so mad at myself now I've said it now I might have to do it because that doesn't and, and I you know I, I literally did not understand what that was supposed to mean it's funny because I've told that first story a lot but I've never told the second half of the story out loud like mm -hmm. this whole idea of like and then this is my calling of the healer I was like oh I don't know what I'm going to I didn't want to be a healer. I wasn't left out to be a healer at yeah. all. And I was very opposed to the word psychic. It took me years to get over that word. And then I wasn't really crazy about healer. I wanted to like crystal. Right. So crystals safe. are safe. Right? Safe. I mean, yeah. So, so I know that we talk in spiritual language a lot about um, something called the witch world. And I always love that because of the alliteration of the WW, but the witch wound basically breaks down to like, there's this part of us where because we were women in other lifetimes and because we were doing that sacred work, you know, I mean, there was a time that I could have been drowned for having red hair. There was a time that, you know, you could have been drowned for knowing too much about herbs or being too smart or opening your mouth at the wrong time or whatever, right? Burnt stake, drowned, head cut off kicked out of the tribe, the whole thing, all the stuff I clear for people now, these are all the things that make us say we don't want to be healers because it used to cost you your life to do the work that you found that great joy in and found that great passion in. And so now, um, I again, I help clear that for people so that they can do the work that they came to do in the world because we are not here to, you know, have a J-O-B and to get married and have 2.3 children in a nice home and then to, you know, get old and have grandchildren and die. We're not here for that. Those are all things that we can experience on the way, but we are here for a higher purpose. We are being called to something greater. We are being called to the evolution of the planet and to the evolution of the souls that we are in, as we are embodied, right? We're here to learn. Um, so when you can, when, and I know that all the people who are going to be listening to this are also here to learn. And so I just, you know, I know that if you're hearing this, you, you're being invited to remember that your nervous system is not the nervous system of the person who was, you know, shamed, blamed, and, and possibly destroyed that you are resilient and that you lived through that initiation by fire, sometimes literally, and that now you're being invited into something greater and you're being invited into the healing of the planet. We're at, scientists say we're like at 11.59 on the digital clock and we're very close to um, screwing everything up forever again. And when I say forever, I mean there was Atlantis, did a good job there, then there was Lemuria, you do such a good, good job there, but it went faster. And now we have literally the Third Reich. We are being invited into this, this healing. And if we screw it up again, you know, the planet will slough us off and we'll start over. But what if it didn't have to happen like that? What if go easier to go hard and it's going to go easier this time? And it's going to take the women to do that. You know, the Dalai Lama said the world will be saved by the Western woman. And actual you, actual me, actual everybody listening. And I truly believe that. I've been doing a lot of work and channeling lately about 
the interesting times that we're in, right? And I believe that the fifth dimension is happening now. And we have that opportunity for the prophesized thousand years of peace. And and there's a turning point where there is no turning back from the from the wrong. And there is a turning point where we go into a benevolent society that's filled with peace and love and joy. And it doesn't have to be hard anymore. And and you've helped me with a lot of that. I remember clearing. I had an old belief that was brought to me by my parents because they owned a business. And the belief was you work 100 hours a week um, so that you can not work 40 hours for yourself. So you could not work 40 hours for someone else. And we were even talking about that in, in the call that you did earlier today is that it doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to be so many hours. It can actually be less hours, more fun, more play, and still be actually changing the world. And, th- mm-hmm. and that's what is, and I know a lot of our listeners, people who are in your audience and my audience, we're here to be changed. And, and I feel that calling is literally right now in the point of astrologically. Um, you can see this is quick season if you're watching it fresh or you never know when you're going to watch this. But I do know that we're in it right here. And I believe the light is winning. And it's going mm. to win. Mm, I do too. I mean, that's my, you know, my core belief is that, you know, we are not going to end up being everybody else in a movie where, you know, the planet's destroyed and you're the one, you know, somebody else is looking on, but you're the one in the destroyed planet. And so you just get obliterated. it. But if it comes down to that, you know, we just all have to remember that we are going on. We'll learn our lessons somewhere else, some other way. But I believe that those lessons can be achieved without us all having to leave the planet, without the planet having to slough us off and start over. Um, but um, but it's going to come through the women, and it's going to come through that matriarchal line, because we are the people who are the nurturers and the creators of, of life. Um, while a woman cannot create a life without a man, the woman grows and nurtures the life and then raises the life. That is the like, in, like sort of the you know the imperative. And we were talking to somebody, by the way, who's never had her own kids. I'm not saying that's every, but I'm saying that in general, you know, the mother is the one that that raises the child. Not every child, not every mother, and sometimes it's the father. Like, for example, was mostly raised by my dad, right? So because my mom was the one who left, not my father. But those are. Um, you know, those are exceptions in person and those are exceptions in nature and all of that. And I think all that's fine, but I'm saying that it's the woman and the nurture, the woman knows the agony of raising a son to go be cannon father, right? That's not the way that a man sees it in the same way. And again, this, I don't want to stereotype, that's not the point. The point is to, to recognize that you are being invited into something more than just the raising of children, you're being invited into the raising of consciousness as a woman, and that that's the invitation to you to birth something new into the world because it is the woman's um, job, almost without exception, and nature to give birth. That's the point. And I know one of your passions is to empower women to be in the wealthy woman archetype yeah. because it is when women have the money, we spend it on community, we spend it on a lot more philanthropic endeavor, and we put our wealth into the betterment of the world. And I think that's something you're passionate about. Yeah, yeah this, thank you for remembering that. And um, from the statistic that I had shared with you even a couple of years ago, and that is that um, women uh, recirculate between 80 and 90% of the money that they earn in what I call their village. And the village is their family or their local community. And with men, they're recirculating about 30 to 40% of that money. So again, not without exception. It's not, you know, it's not like, oh, look at those deadbeat dads. You know, that's not the point. But rather that the woman's tendency is to reinvest. I, I um, have a podcast called Goddess 
Crypto. It's got about 55 episodes. It's a clean season at the moment, but it'll be wrapping up again. But um, your listeners can go to goddessofcrypto.me if they're interested in getting a really great bunch of women, because it's all by women, for women, um, training you on uh, what's going on in crypto and what has been going on in crypto for the last few years. Um, but I, I just want to share that um, I had a woman on the podcast, and she said the most profound thing. She said that the men are asking when Lambo, and when is spelled W-E-N, by the way, and that's, um, that's crypto language short form for when is my Lamborghini pulling into the driveway because I make so much damn money in crypto. And that the women are not asking that question. The women are asking when college vacation, you know, when college education, when family vacation. And that is a very, that energy is very big. That, that shift in understanding about like, what are women going to do with their crypto, you know, money bags versus what are men going to do with it? The guys are thinking about like, where's my next toy? And the women are thinking about where is the thing that I can help my family with the most? And so I feel like all the things, and I've done tons of interviews in that, and I've done tons of work on women and wealth, that fundamental difference to me more than anything tells the story of why women are the ones who need the wealth. And I'm going to remind everybody that just as, you know, women are now having to say, keep your laws off my body, they're also having to say, keep your laws off of my cash. Um, This is the year that women have the 50th anniversary of being able to have their own credit cards, their own bank accounts, and their own mortgages in their own names. So Michelle, in your lifetime, in my lifetime, and in the lifetime of you know many of the listeners, we both experienced family units where that was not acceptable. And as a result of that, where women were shut down or stunted in some way, because we were told we're not allowed to, whatever. I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, my father said to me, anything you want, the author said to me, it's as easy to marry a rich man as it is to marry a poor one, right? And that was his expectation. He was like, I don't care where you go to college because you're just going to get married anyway. He's going to meet a guy and you're just going to get married. And, you know, he was right. I did, but I did care where I went to college and I did meet my first husband there and I did leave his house because he was terrible with money, among other reasons. So it's just all, you know, we allow ourselves to have these limitations and we got to let go of the limitations. I, I do. I remember my mother uh, fighting for some of the rights that we think are very, um, we're, we just assume them now. And, and we forget how short of an amount of time that is, and even how short of a time it's been since we could vote. It's really not that many years, or it's really only a couple so of generations. It's 100 and, 105 years since women have been given the vote. But. And so we wonder why, as women, as a collective consciousness, we have fear. And people are like, why do why are women so so hard you know are harsh and the answer is we have rights and we're not willing to give them up anymore or mm-hmm. we're not going to allow ourselves to go backwards and and from that we don't want society to go backwards well and that's what's happening right now i mean we're burning books again we're, you know, we're uh, telling women what they can and cannot learn in school. Um, we repeal Roe versus Wade because we believe that, you know, the law was not a well, you know, constructed law, but that's crap. They just repealed it because they don't want women to have the right to say what they want to say about their own bodies. And it's really, it's so devastating to me because, you know, just talking about women's rights for a minute. If you wanted to repeal Roe v. Wade, for example, okay, great. Where's the prenatal care? Where's the nurturing, the free, you know, health care for, you know, pregnant women or the free deliveries? Where are the channels to connect all the mothers that need to adopt babies with babies themselves so that, you know, women cannot be strapped to that kid that they can't afford or shouldn't have in the first place or didn't want or whatever, so that there's a 
again, society that nurtures that unwed mother or that mother that can't afford the kid or that, you know, or, or that mother who, you know, doesn't like can't handle having a baby with severe mental disabilities and somebody is going to love that kid or want that kid or whatever. We're not having those conversations at all. So when it comes to our bodies and when it comes to our choices, we're, it is being reduced. It is being shut down and it's not being done in a way that says we actually really care about the rights of women. Um, so when I see women who are like, you know, that's not okay for religious purposes or whatever, I'm like, but there's, there's so much more to be done and have that not be okay. And it would like, you know, make it better. It's the same thing about educating women. It's the same, you know, we, we always try to take the education away from the girls. And let's go back to money for a minute. There's never been money education, but there's really never been money education. I've asked men, like, who taught you about money? Like, who taught, oh, my dad taught me. Okay. Well, there isn't normally, and I've heard exceptions, the mother telling the daughter, this is how you do this, or this is how you do that, because she didn't have that education herself. But most women are like, oh, I was standing behind the door when they handed that out at school. And I'm like, no, you weren't. They didn't hand it out at school at all. There is no none of that education. We can get it. So when a woman says, like, I'm less than because I have a money feeling or I'm less than because I have a, um, you know, a belief that I, I can't have or I'm not allowed to have or whatever, it's not fair for that woman at all because she's, she's telling herself a story on top of the not having the education, she's now telling herself the story that it's her fault that she doesn't have the education. And that's not true at all. So your job is to like get out there and get the education. Michelle, do you feel well, I'm, 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 I'm your job is just but that you actually do educate women. But absolutely. Yes. And I and I want that's what I want to ask you. So do you feel more educated about money now than when you first met me? Oh, thousand percent like this that's why i wanted you to be one of the the forerunners of of foundation of what i want to bring out is because not only did you teach me about actual literal investing mm -hmm. like yeah like yeah. She, she what i love is that you're a very practical person and i love that i my poorest nature loves the practical right um, but for me, the, the shift came in the mystical and, and it was the mindset, um, that, and, and I'm going to get real specific, right? So I wasn't told I was enough. And so, and I reiterated that in relationships when I was younger and the good news is I had a interesting dynamic where my mother and my grandmother's both sides did tell me where I was enough. My father, who I still love, but my father who actually had wounds in his childhood for not being enough. And this is where we do the work about ancestral heritage. He wasn't enough. His father wasn't enough. And then he put that onto me, his only child as not enough. And then to add not enough as a woman. And you, you add both the paradigm of the historic feeling of not being enough, and then you combine it with the female um, archetype of not being enough. And Her story he me, instead of his story. Yes. And he wanted me to be a certain weight because he wanted me to be able to marry right. And he wanted me to fall into certain categories so that I could be okay. And he wanted me to take business in college, which I actually should have done, but I was an artist and he wanted me to be different. And so I was never told I was okay just being what I was. And I was told I didn't have enough energy. I wanted to do, I wanted to be a counselor. You know, I wanted to be an artist or a counselor. And they said, well, you don't have enough money to go to college to uh, be a counselor because you have to get a master's degree in that. And so here I am years later going exactly that route. But here's the thing. 
when I worked with you and, and, and I'm going to say other, other fantastic coaches, but in this case, you were the one who went really deep in the mental for me about overcoming that I am enough. And when that shifted energetically, and I know this is the work you do and, and we want to bring this to every woman we know, every person we know really, is that once you're enough, you're not limited by ceiling. You're not limited by programming. You're not limited by what someone else tells you you can have. Your only limitation is your mind. And when you start realizing you can hack your brain, then you actually see that your limitation is the next feeling you have to overcome. And and that's mm-hmm. what that's where I'm at right now is, you know, I overcame a certain ceiling with you a couple of times. And now I get to go through another ceiling. And and once you've done it a couple of times, then you realize it's just a different level of mindset each layer up. Mm-hmm. I love that. I, I really love that. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and you're like, you know, I am not enough. And I know that for one or many women, um, just know, you know, Michelle's a great example. You can heal that. You didn't, you are not having to be stuck with that your entire life. It's very, very powerful to shift out of that. I am not enough and into being enough for yourself because it like to me everything trickles down from that and I think that's really beautiful. Um well, I know that I, for what happens is when you don't think you're enough, then you are given the thoughts of and and are shown that there isn't enough stuff. If you're not mm-hmm. enough then and that's more mm-hmm. when it comes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I you know it it does circle around exactly like that where the lack creates more lack, creates more lack, creates more lack. I um one of my favorite coaching things is the idea of the the lack gap. And the lack gap is when you don't have something, you're aware of not having it. So you walk around telling the story of not having it, which because thoughts become things, means that you don't have it, you don't have it, you don't have it, and you're reiterating, reiterating, reiterating. So you still don't have it, you still don't have it, you still don't have it. It's like you've fallen in the lack gap and it's a deep trough. It's very hard to get out of. You want to close the lack gap. The first thing you do is walk around acting like the thing that, you know, if I had that million dollars, if I had that perfect relationship, if I had that whatever, you know, like we were talking about on the call, why am I clearing out my house right now? Because I'm getting prepared to move. Do I have another house yet? No. Do I have the mortgage, you know, lined up? Do I have the, you know, the, um, the house, even the neighborhood lined up? Not even, like, I'm not starting from there. I'll get there. I'll, I'll get to all of that stuff. But rather, I'm starting from if I were moving in June, what would I start doing? Well, I got it. Wow. This place is like full of stuff. I got it. You know, I got to get ready and I got to get that cleared out. So that's the thing that came up first. And so that's what I'm in the process of doing. But I'm holding the space energetically that, oh, in June I'm moving. And in June I've got a new place. So what's that going to look like? And so that's what I'm doing. And it's very interesting to be in that space because there's no negativity there. It's like, oh, I'm just going to go live in the future for a while. And in the future, this is the way that things are. And when you can do that and be aligned and get out of your own way, like if I'm telling you that, I'm like, yeah, because that's what's happening. It's like not, oh, it's, what if it doesn't? I've said it on camera and like, that's not happening for me, right? I'm having, I'm just like, oh yeah, this is what's happening. So awesome. Now, questions can come up and I don't make those choices and I don't do, sure, I guess. I mean, you can, you know, sometimes like new energy comes in and you end up doing something completely yeah, different. Something you better. Better. This or something bad, or yes, that's an, a wonderful Abraham. So, yeah, I, I really love that. Uh, I really appreciate you taking some time to share little pieces of your wisdom. Hopefully, we will get to see you again in a later episode. Um, in the meantime, if they are wanting to get a hold of you, I know you have a really amazing new program all on the market right now. Um, um, so, will you let them know? the little bits of details of how to get off of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, 
So uh, the new program is called Wealth Elevation. And um, in order to uh, check that out, um, there's actually a, um, a, there's a replay of a masterclass that I did recently on mywealthelevation.com. But I also want to invite your, um, your listeners to pick up a free gift that I have. Um, it's called the top 10 things every woman needs to know about money. And it is a very powerful thing because it's not things that everybody thinks. It's, you know, it's not like, you know, oh, here's some financial advice. It's all based on like the spiritual works. Top of things every woman needs to know about money. And in order to get that, and again, it's my gift to you, you can just go to Hallie, H-A-L-E, HallieMoney.com. HallieMoney.com. So there we'll you go. We will have that in the links um, for you as well. But I just, to, to final note, um, I always say this when I when I'm with Hallie or around Hallie. She literally is one of my inspirations. And so if you don't know her, definitely follow her because she is a thought leader and just an all-around magical person. Thank you so much and live magically.